this is the first afternoon session of the uh, 2016 Annual State History Conference. As you have heard throughout the day, our theme for this conference is Rural Utah Western Issues. I'm Greg Thompson. I'm the Associate Dean for Special Collections at the J. Willard Marriott <laughs> Library at the University of Utah. And indeed, it's my pleasure to welcome you and thank you for coming to this session. The session runs from 1.45 to 3, and we have three presenters, as you can see. We've asked the presenters to hold their remarks to 20 minutes uh, so that we would have some time for questions from you, the audience. And uh, we have a timekeeper here so to help me with that, and uh, thank you for uh, undertaking that challenge. I'd like to introduce the three speakers um, as they are listed, I believe, in your program. Our first speaker is Justin Sorensen. Justin is the GIS specialist for the J. Willard Marriott Library, University of Utah, and responsible for the GIS services uh, unit of the Creati Creativity and Innovation Services Department at the library. Justin is a graduate of the University of Utah with a strong background in GIS technology and geographic studies. Since 2011, Justin has been responsible for the creation and development of the library's geospatial uh, projects and resources available for use by students, faculty, staff, and you, the community. Um, his presentation is entitled, Exploring Utah's Nuclear History Through the Downwinders of Utah Archive. Our second presenter is Kamiyan Dilge. Her presentation is entitled, The Past That Was Differs Little from the Past That Was Not, Pictographs and Petroglyphs in Carmack, Carmack McCarthy's Blood Mer Meridian or The Evening Redness in the West. Cami is an instructor and graduate student at Utah State University. She also works in the USU Office of Research and Graduate Studies on the Project Management and Communications team. Her research includes studies on the Great Salt Lake, uh, its resorts, local land arts, and the people that settled around its shores. She also conducted historical research on religious <coughs> sites in the United States. Kind of a nice broad topic. Cami specializes in communication, editing, literary analysis, research, teaching, website and social media management, and writing. She's interested in adversary for minority populations, architecture, documentation, documenting personal histories, history itself, and landscape exploration and writing. Our third <coughs> presenter this afternoon is Kenneth P. Cannon, Dr. Kenneth P. Cannon, speaking uh, to the topic of Across the Desert, the Archaeology of the Chinese Railroad Workers, Box Elder County, Utah. Dr. Cannon, received his PhD in geography from the University of Nebraska-Lincoln prior to become president of USU Archaeology Services. He spent 21 years with the National Park Service. He has published widely in interdisciplinary uh, journals on such topics as hunting, hunter-gatherers in Jackson Hole, to the biogeography of bison to the archaeology of Chinese world, or excuse me, uh, railroad workers. He has received competitive grants for his research from the National Science Foundation and the Earth Watch Institute, among others. With that, we'll start with Justin. And again, thank you for joining us this afternoon. Well, I'm excited to present to you today a creative and innovative archive designed to bring together information on Utah's nuclear history that describes the impacts that Utah has experienced throughout its turn, <laughs> throughout this time. 
The Downwinders of Utah Archive accomplishes this, this by presenting information, stories, and experiences which are key to understanding the story of a dark time in our nation's history. Beginning in 1951, the era of nuclear weapons testing was a time of tremendous change at both national and local levels. In the name of national security, a variety of nuclear weapons were tested in a remote area of the, of the Nevada desert known as the Nevada Test Site. Fallout and radiation from these tests have affected communities across the nation, in many cases resulting in the loss of property, health, and life. The Downwinders of Utah Archive presents an in-depth study of the nuclear detonations, radioactive fallout, and events which have led to devastating results for Utah's downwinder population. Through the presentation of an interactive timeline, detailed information on each atmospheric nuclear test conducted at the Nevada test site in which radioactivity was detected <coughs> off-site has been presented, as well as fault statistics for all Utah counties that are geospatially visualized based on raw data and presented through cartographic maps, animated reconstruction models, interactive motion charts, and a variety of graphics related to testing methods, cloud heights, and dispersal patterns. The archive also presents historical photographs and videos of nuclear detonations, archive newspaper articles and documentation depicting impacts and government deception imparted to residents, as well as oral history interviews with a few of Utah's surviving downwinders. And I'll be touching on these components during this presentation. Through the Downwinders of Utah archive, viewers are able to examine the contained information and utilize it within educational and research endeavors. The searchable timeline allows for easy access to time-specific data, visualizations, and information on demand. Each component presents detailed information regarding each event, as shown in this example, presenting information on the name, date, time, device type, yield, atmospheric release of iodine-131, which is a nuclear byproduct produced during the detonation process, and much more. Historical photographs and videos captured for each event are included to provide viewers with a real-world depiction of each event, while incorporating satellite imagery and three-dimensional visual models of individual sites as a frame of reference of how each location appears today. These are a few of those uh, 3D images here as well. In this video example, we're witnessing one of the nuclear tests that were being conducted. Uh, this happens to be the first and only test of the atomic cannon back on May 25, 1953. Uh, it was later called Operation Upshot Not Hole Test Grave. But you'll notice right after this violent blast, you'll see the deadly mushroom cloud quickly rises high into the atmosphere. One of the primary features of the Downwinders of Utah Archive is the geospatial visualization of nuclear fallout events, in particular the examination of iodine-131 ground deposits for all counties throughout Utah. Iodine-131 is one of the many nuclear byproducts produced during the nuclear detonations and it's been high, found to be highly associated with thyroid cancer. Scientists have found that following a detonation, nuclear sediment is lifted high into the atmosphere and carried away from the testing site by wind currents where it then falls back to the Earth's surface, generally over pastures and populated areas. In addition to general fallout exposure, scientists have found that sediment attached itself to the grazing material of sheep, goats, and cows, whose milk was highly consumed and utilized by local farmers and populations of the day. To examine the extent of fallout among Utah downwinders, cartographic maps and geospatial visualizations have been created to examine and interpret the data in ways previously unavailable. Geospatial visualizations <coughs> such as these are available for all individual test detonations, test series summaries, and in this example, a complete overview of all iodine-131 recorded in Utah. Uh, you'll notice that for this area, uh, especially around St. George and the surrounding areas, we're receiving the biggest impact of iodine-131. At the time, this consisted of farmers and Mormon settlers, and what was found was that this was a segment of the population the government considered to be low use. Detonation reconstruction animations have been created to portray the setup, detonation, and aftermath of each type of nuclear test conducted at the Nevada test site. 
Each testing method was extensively researched and subsequently reconstructed using data from the United States Department of Energy as well as aircraft and device specifications from Boeing and Wikipedia. These detonation reconstruction animations are available in two and three dimensional formats. Historical photographs of aircrafts, atomic guns, and devices were used as a reference when modeling each animation to ensure the maximum possible resemblance and realism. All, annotations include an all animations include annotations throughout the course of the detonation to describe and break down each stage of the explosion to the viewer. The diagrams and charts included within the Downwinders of Utah archive depict a wide array of information related to nuclear detonations, radiation exposure, and fallout in general. Motion charts offer us a new perspective on thyroid dosage and iodine-131 concentrations by allowing viewers the opportunity to interactively compare one set of raw data to another in a visual and dynamic way. The resulting comparisons can be depicted across all counties in Utah, or a few can be highlighted for a more specified study, with each test shot series and overview having their own corresponding motion chart. Cloud height diagrams have been created to show the scale of mushroom clouds resulting from each nuclear test blast. One graphic has been created for each operation conducted at the Nevada test site in which the off-site radioactivity was detected. To further demonstrate the sheer size of these mushroom clouds, a scaled group of buildings have been included each of which being, at one point in time, the tallest building in the world. These range from the Empire State Building in New York City to Burj Khalifa in Dubai. Diagrams depicting the methods by which humans are exposed to iodine-131 and the resulting health impacts iodine has on the human body have also been included. These are especially significant as they demonstrate how many downwinders became exposed and the path by which fallout was absorbed into their system. Historical events and publications comprise a considerable portion of the Downwinders of Utah archive, chronologically relaying information and events as they progress. <coughs> Major events included include court cases with victims and sheep ranchers with external links to official transcripts for review, testing ban treaties such as the Limited Test Ban Treaty, which later changed how nuclear testing was conducted by prohibiting all test detonations in the atmosphere, in space, or underwater while continuing to allow for underground testing, as well as important government programs such as the Radiation Exposure Compensation Act created to compensate victims of nuclear exposure, with official links, information on qualified applicants, and a geospatial visualization breaking down counties eligible for compensation. Historical newspaper articles and additional documentation are included to relay the information and statements provided to the public while documenting how government positions changed over time with respect to nuclear testing. These demonstrate the government standing of initially there was no impacts from nuclear testing up to the 1980s when victims with fall ailments were being recognized. Utah Governor Scott Matheson addressed this in a 1985 KWD documentary where he describes how the government's deception behind nuclear tests was uncovered. That's when we started to find out for the very first time that our uh, federal uh, public officials, mostly in the old Atomic Energy Commission days, were simply not telling the truth. And that's when we found that there was a major effort on the part of the federal government to do two things. To hide relevant information which showed wrongdoing on the one hand, and intimidation of those who were associated with the program to continue funding of that program on the other. Each related article has been collected and chronologically presented with a brief synopsis of the main points, a preview of the original article, and a link for viewing the full article via the J. Willard Marriott Library's ProQuest account. Through the Downwinders of Utah archive, you'll learn that the Atomic Energy Commission, or the AEC, put extensive amounts of time and energy into presenting a positive image of itself and nuclear testing to the surrounding public. Brochures and public announcements were made explaining the importance of American nuclear superiority and the safety measurements taken by the AEC during atomic testing. Residents of St. George and the surrounding areas were told they were a very real part of national defense through nuclear testing a statement designed to spark their patriotism. While assuring civilians testing posed no danger, the AEC simultaneously admitted that individuals had been exposed to potential risk from flash, blast, or fallout. 
During emergencies, when the AEC determined it was unsafe for civilians to be outside, radio announcements were made telling everyone to stay indoors. But unfortunately, people were often away from their radio sets and regularly missed such rare warnings. Ladies and gentlemen, we interrupt this program to bring you important news. Due to a change in wind direction, the residue from this morning's atomic detonation is drifting in the direction of St. George. To prevent unnecessary exposure to radiation, it is better to take cover during this period. Parents need not be alarmed about children at school. No recesses outdoors will be permitted. There is no danger. This is simply routine safety procedure. In contrast to the AEC's reassuring radio broadcast, Frank Patrico, a serviceman responsible for monitoring levels of radioactivity, recounts the AEC's hesitance and reluctance to disclose the looming danger facing St. George and the surrounding area. I happened to look at my instrument and noticed that in the center of St. George, Utah, where I was located, the instrument was reading well over 300 to 350 millirectons per hour, which was just about the, the range of the instrument. Obviously, these were higher readings than the maximum permissible levels established by AEC on a national basis. Mutrico notified the test site. But his records show almost an hour passed before he was told to issue a warning that the residents of St. George should take cover. It wasn't too much of a surprise that not everybody had the word. Cars were still on the road within St. George. People were still walking on the streets. And most distressing, when we passed the grade school, we noticed that the children were still on their morning recess the teacher having not received the, the information about taking cover. I received instructions to be sure and discard my clothing and to be sure and keep showering until I reduced the amount of radiation that was on my body. I should point out that I did ask whether we should be doing the same thing in an announcement to people in the community. And of course the answer was a resounding no because uh, this would create a, a, a panic situation. As part of the Downwinders of Utah archive, a number of interviews are presented relaying information on Downwinders, nuclear testing, and how the government is attempting to make restitution to victims. In an excerpt interview conducted at the J. Willard Marriott Library with former Utah Congressman Jim Matheson, his thoughts regarding the radiation co Exposure Compensation Act are revealed, and he, and he breaks down for us his efforts for bringing justice and compensation to downwinder victims. Ultimately, the tangible admission of the government that, that it lied and that it was at fault was when Congress passed the Radiation Exposure Compensation Act, which is known as RECA. Uh, that happened before I got in Congress, but that was a very significant step in my opinion. And to me, it wasn't really about the monetary compensation, it was more about the admission that the government did something wrong. Um, on the other hand, I, I think it's important for the victims to have access to that compensation. When I first got in office, the challenge was that the fund was uh, underfunded, if you will. So people who were dying of cancer would make their application for compensation under RECA, and the government, in effect, gave them an IOU and said, well, we'll get back to you later, which was unconscionable, in my opinion. And so when I first got in Congress, the, the effort to make sure compensation victims, uh, I mean victims of the testing receive a compensation, that's the first thing I worked on in this issue. And uh, fortunately the, the issue was so compelling. I mean had people in Congress said, wait a minute, we can't, we can't do this. We told these people we compensate them, you can't give them an IOU. And so uh, that issue did get resolved. But that was during my first term in Congress, that's what I was really active on. In addition to interviews such as these, a number of oral history interviews with Downwinder victims, families, and advocates are presented, which play an important role within the Downwinders of Utah archive, as is through stories and experiences such as these that a deeper understanding and connection to history and events are made. As an example of how interviews are presented, this excerpt from an interview from the 1985 KUED, 30 Years to Justice, demonstrates how stories and experiences bring light to history and events while developing a deeper understanding of their impacts within our communities. I was sitting on my horse and I just had my legs cocked over the saddle just watching the feed back. And I turned and looked this way and there were some airplanes 
I just followed him right along and went right over in here and, and I was looking right straight into him and all at once there was a great big flash and a, and a big mushroom cloud come up and a second or two later a big boom. And I just went like that. It was a, just a big flash right over in there. I mushroomed up and then it was spreading out. You know, just spreading out, it was quite a big cloud, and it was coming, it came right over. And some army personnel, they pulled right up to camp beside us. Of course, we came out inside the wagon, and they said, My golly, you guys are in a hot spot here. And you got to get out of here. Get out of here. There was no way. We had that herd of sheep. We were on our way in. We were going this way toward Cedar to Lamb. We had a little tender wagon. He said, get in that wagon and, and get under what cover you can. Something obviously went wrong with that test shot. Nearby, 200 miners were rushed underground to avoid exposure to radioactive fallout, while Bullock and his herd of sheep were left exposed in the open valley, far closer to ground zero than the miner. Through the Downwinders of Utah archive, viewers are able to access currently submitted interviews by selecting an individual's name. This will have a brief um, overview of the interview, a streaming audio or transcribed video file of the interview conducted, and a PDF tr transcript for review. Viewers also have the opportunity to record and share their stories and become part of the Downwinders of Utah archive and its growing number of interviews and personal accounts. The Downwinders of Utah archive has been created and designed to bring together information on Utah's nuclear history in a way that educates students, researchers, and the public of this dark time in our nation's history. Newer generations may be unaware of the devastation produced during this era, leading to the creation of a creative and educational tool for understanding the topic in greater depth. The archives focus on individuals, families, and areas impacted most as a result of this nuclear testing, aids in understanding the events in greater detail, while educating future generations in hopes that the mistakes of the past will never occur again. It's easy to say that the nuclear testing was performed in the name of national security, but when we overlook the impacts those actions have had within our communities, we're leading ourselves open to making the same mistakes again, which is a goal that the Downwinders of Utah Archive hopes to prevent. In a final excerpt from our interview with former Utah Congressman Jim Matheson, these points are emphasized through his statement about the future of Downwinders and nuclear testing within our country. Well, first of all, I think that what, what folks need to know is, is that there, that there is not a test that's imminent, but you've got to remain vigilant. During my time in Congress, uh, there have been various efforts to develop new, uh, nuclear weapons. The Bush administration had two particular nuclear weapons it was trying to develop. Um, then there was an effort to do a, uh, a, di a different type of test. It was known as divine strength was the name of the specific test. It was not with a nuclear weapon. It was with conventional explosives. But the tonnage was so large, you could never replicate a, a conventional bomb. It was clearly an, a precursor for nuclear weapons testing. And my office actually uncovered the documents that showed that that's exactly what that test was intended to be. So, so at various times during my time in Congress, there have been efforts to move ahead with more nuclear weapons testing. And I, what I would tell any one who lives downwind is, is that uh, you can never take it for granted. I mean, I'm not saying we should panic because there isn't a test that's going to happen right away, but there will always, over the years, be entities that want to move ahead with the new round of testing, and that's why we need to keep an eye on this issue. The Downwinders of Utah archive is available for viewing at downwindersofutah.org. We invite everyone to visit the website and view the archive in its entirety while learning how you can contribute to and become part of the growing Downwinders of Utah archive. Thank you. Uh, I wanted to say before I begin this presentation uh, that the images that I've used are all place-based and uh, the illustrations come from primary documents uh, by the historical character that were illustrated or created by the historical characters that are involved in this um, historical fiction narrative. Uh, Cormac McCarthy's uh, Blood Meridian or Evening Redness in the West dramatizes the United States' national quest for manifest destiny through the lens of the human scalp trade in the Mexico territory that took place during the 1800s. And this presentation um, is a little bit further south than than our landscape of Utah, 
but a lot of the concepts are translatable to uh, issues of this state. Uh, there has not been extensive study or conversation about the pictographs or petroglyph images that Carmack chooses to uh, talk about or present in, in Bud Meridian. However, like Harold Bloom, a, a history scholar, I believe that McCarthy references these historical documents to draw critical attention to the destruction of the American Indian nations of the Southwest and the subsequent cover-up of this history, a tragedy that the reader relives through McCarthy's writing. So with the, tre with the signing of the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo in 1848, uh, this formally concluded the U.S.-Mexico War, and Mexico gave up 500,000 square miles of territory to the United States. This text, Blood Meridian, is set just after the conclusion of the war, and the narrative follows the kid who signs up for a filibuster company under Captain White to journey from the United States to the Mexico Territory to stake illegal land claims after the treaty has been signed but before the country's new borders have been determined. Captain White's justification... Could you say just a little louder? Sure. <laughs> So, um, as I was saying, uh, the narrative follows the kid. Is that any better? Um, and he signs up for a filibuster company after the Mex ex after the war with the U.S. and Mexico is <coughs> over. So, an illegal company that goes down into the borderlands to stake illegal land claims. Um, and he's under the direction of Captain White. And Captain White's justification, he says, we are dealing with a people manifestly incapable of governing themselves. And do you know what happens with people who cannot govern themselves? That's right, others come in to govern for them. With Captain White's promise of the spoils of war, the filibuster army leaves Bexar, Texas, crosses the Frio Nueces and Del Norte rivers, journeying ever deeper into Mexico territory. The kid eventually defects from this filibuster company and joins up with Glanton's gang. This group is based on the historical gang of contracted scalp hunters led by Captain John Glanton, um, an illustration of him here, who terrorized the Mexico borderlands in order to harvest Apache scalps for bounty. In the gang, the kid meets his antagonist, the judge, whose character is based also on another historical figure, the infamous Judge Holden. He was an evil man who was obsessed with blood, money, and lechery. The narrative follows the gang's movements in the Southwest and as Glanton's gang wanders murderously throughout Mexico territory, they camp at Hueco Tanks, Texas. One of the largest concentrations of pictographs in North America is located in these domes, as you can see here. Weathering and erosion have created several hollows or huecos in Spanish in the stone that trap and contain water. And this has drawn people to this desert oasis for almost 11,000 years. Hueco Tanks is the only region, excuse me, the only place in the region where every prehistoric and historic time period is represented in the images depicted on stone. Thus, the individuals who frequented the area created a traceable landscape or traceable presence a uh, traceable record of their presence in the landscape. While there have been several groups of indigenous inhabitants at Hueco Tanks, rarely have these groups painted or carved over each other's images. Some scholars believe this may be out of respect for the existing message. And pictured here is a vibrant, 
vibrantly colored, sacred kachina mask. On the other hand, European newcomers to the area inscribed their names together with dates on the rock walls, often superimposing their traditional form of recording over indigenous documents. The earliest Anglo date written on the stone at Hueco Tanks is 1849, which appears painted over some of the pictographs. McCarthy, in his book, matched this date exactly with the arrival of Glanton's gang at Hueco Tanks, who historically would have been targeting the Apache raiding extensively in this area between 1820 and 1840. Perhaps the same Apache who would have painted pictures of their rituals and also depicted their contact with the Spaniards, Mexicans, and Anglos in this area. As you can see, this stone is marked in crude English, water here, because there is a spring nearby. No doubt McCarthy envisioned the gang taking refuge in this desert sanctuary. After all, they had been wandering ravenous and doomed and mute as gorgons shambling the brutal wastes. Interestingly, McCarthy describes the gang as gorgons Gorgons are mythical creatures, if, if, if any of you are familiar with the Medusa figure. Uh, they have the ability to turn whoever they look at into stone. This depiction is critical in order to understand events that happen next in the text. That evening, as Glanton's gang camps at Hueco Tanks, the judge wanders about the ancient paintings of men and animals, and of the chase and curious birds and arcane maps, chooses a few which he required and traces them into his ledger book to take away with him. <coughs> Next, amongst the hundreds of images to be seen at Hueco Tanks, the judge selects out one and scrapes it away from the rock, leaving only a raw place on the stone where it had been. So in a Gorgon-like fashion, the judge gazes on the image and in an instant, he scalpels away the pictograph. He turns it back into the mere stone from which it was born as if it had never existed. This defacement reminds us of the inscriptions the Anglo and the Spanish made atop the images at Hueco Tanks. As I previously noted, superimposition of images by the different groups of indigenous, group, indigenous inhabitants at this location were rare. On the other hand, at the Zuni Reservation, a region containing images of Kachina masks like those found at Hueco Tanks, several examples of repeated or superimposed imagery, and by that term I mean um, the images appear on top of, the, of one another, by, by these indigenous inhabitants occur. Scholar M. Jane Young, who studied this area, proposes that repetition and superimposition of rock images may be a method of imbuing an area with power or designating a place that is powerful. But just as putting one carving or painting on top of another may increase the power of this second image or the place, this action may also be a method of taking power away from the first image maybe even a means for one cultural group to establish or express dominion over another in a particular place. The judge's appropriation of the images into his ledger book and the defacement of the design reveal that more than simple disregard for the past, the judge aims to control it. And I will explain. Throughout the narrative, the judge is continually writing in his ledger. He's keeping an account of his transactions, his comings and goings. He documents flora, fauna, and historical artifacts around him. The purpose of a ledger is to record place, date, authors, witnesses, and events. In business, should anyone ask for the current balance in an accounting system, the ledger shows the answer. 
The judge appears to use the ledger book for its historically intended purpose, to function as an inventory and an account. But he skews the information he enters into the log. When asked by a member of Glanton's gang who watched the judge make, the, make his notations, what was his purpose in all this? The judge answered, whatever in creation exists without my knowledge exists without my consent. At one point, the judge places his hand on the ground and declares, this is my claim, and yet everywhere upon it are pockets of autonomous life. In order for it to be mine, nothing must be permitted to occur upon it save by my dispensation. When pressed by a fellow scalp hunter, who asked the judge what he aimed to do with those notes and sketches, the judge smiled and said, it was his intention to expunge them from the memory of man. In another instance, some of, the, some of Glanton's gang tried to contradict the judge's claims on the origins of the earth by quoting scripture. The judge turns to them, smiling, and answers, books lie, and states, Men's memories are uncertain, and the past that was differs little from the past that was not. The danger of the judge's ledger is that it is, the, it is only one account, one witness of his gang's comings and goings in the Mexico territory. To emphasize the grave implications of the appropriation and destruction of the images at Hueco Tanks, McCarthy turns to the analogy of the Gorgon. So, excuse me, he returns to the analogy of the Gorgon. The judge's ease of erasure of the image foreshadows the action of Blanton's gang when three days after this event, they savagely slaughter an entire camp of peaceful Tiguas, wiping them out as if they had never been, as if their deaths were prefigured in the very rock for those with eyes to read and no man stood to tender them a defense. McCarthy continues, in the days to come, the frail black rebuses of blood in those sands would crack and break and drift away so that in, a circuit, in the circuit of a few suns, all trace of the destruction of these people would be erased. The desert wind would salt their ruins and there would be nothing, nor ghost, nor scribe, to tell any pilgrim in his passing how it was that a people had lived in this place and in this place died. Historically, the Spaniards drove the Tiguas, a group of American Indians, out of, the pre out of present day northern New Mexico. A small number of them relocated a few miles east of present day El Paso, Texas, after the 1680 Pueblo Revolt against the Spaniards, which in the context of Blood Meridian would have placed the Tiguas in the area where Glanton's gang massacred them. It should be noted that as a result of the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo in 1848, uh, the catalyst for this narrative, the Tiguas territory, including Hueco tanks, the area they consider sacred, came under Texas rule. And soon after, Anglo homesteaders and settlers seized Tigua land and the tribe very nearly vanished until they were rediscovered in the late 1900s. They point to these historical documents at Hueco Tanks of the pictographic Tigua Shield and their sacred eagle, eagle rock, which you can see does re resemble an eagle, as evidence of their tribal existence. Toward the end of the novel, the judge confronts the kid now grown man, and challenges him to absolve himself of the crimes he committed in Glanton's gang. The kid retaliates, stating he is his own agent, and the judge cannot implicate him for past crimes or actions he never committed. To this, the judge arched his brow. Did you post witnesses? He said, to report to you on the continuing existence of those places once you'd quit them? The judge understands the implications and power of his historical account to manipulate memory. 
Echoing back to Captain White's proclamation in Blood Meridian about Manifest Destiny, Hall Humphreys writes, The only way that Anglo-Americans were able to accomplish the objectives of their Manifest Destiny was to remove the major obstacle in their way, Native Americans. American Indian scholar Craig Womack states, Tribal literatures are not just some branch waiting to be grafted onto the main trunk. Tribal literatures are the tree, the oldest literatures in the Americas, the most American of American literatures. We are the canon. Without, without Native American literature, there is no American canon. May I take an example from my own region, just north of the area where I grew up, the site of the Bear River Massacre, the place many of you will visit tomorrow on a tour through Fort Douglas. In a small and historically inaccurate, des inaccurate designated massacre site, a large Daughters of the Utah Pioneer Monument stands commemorating the event. At a recent annual memorial service, a descendant of the Northern Shoshone shared these words. At this location, 152 years ago today, a tragic event took place in the early morning hours that changed the course of our nation's history. They were massacred at the hands of civilization. <clears throat> Winston, Winston Churchill said, sorry, um, that history is always written by the victors. That explains why the plaque behind me reads, attacks by the Indians on the peaceful inhabitants in this vicinity led to the final battle here on January 29th, 1863. The conflict occurred in deep snow and bitter cold. Scores of wounded and frozen soldiers were taken from the battlefield to the Latter-day Saint community of Franklin, Idaho. Here, pioneer women, trained through the trials and necessity of frontier living, accepted the responsibility of caring for the wounded until they could be removed to Camp Douglas, Utah. If written from the native perspective, the plaque may have said, the massacre of the Northwestern Shoshone Nation occurred in this vicinity on January 29th of 1863. Colonel Patrick E. Connie, and his California volunteers from Camp Douglas, Utah, attacked a sleeping Indian village in the early morning hours of the day. The soldiers shot, bludgeoned, and bayoneted several hundred men, women, and children to their death. <clears throat> the Indians fought with the limited weapons available to them, but the band was all but annihilated. But this is not the end of our story. We will always remember the events of this day. We have forgiven those wrongs, but we will never forget. As you can see <clears throat> from the top of the monument, there is a superimposition of sorts, a cement teepee that has been placed on top of this marker. Historically, American Indian records have often been destroyed, appropriated, misinterpreted, or ignored because they are oral, pictographic, or seen as mysterious and mythical. The judge wisely observed in Blood Meridian that if witnesses are not posted, if accurate records are, records are not kept, or if they are disregarded, then there is no evidence of crimes committed against these groups. And no trial can exist without evidence. If American Indian histories are acknowledged, the result will be that crimes committed toward these groups will be brought to light. So how shall we respond? Are we ready to? If the history of the United States is properly amended, then such a type of restitution can take place. This may be in a variety of forms. Changes in United States government policy, honoring United States and American Indian treaties, returning tribal land and access to resources to these historically marginalized populations. I ask again, 
Are we ready to rewrite the ledger books? Thank you. So this project was funded as a collaborative effort between USU Archaeological Service and the USU Museum of Anthropology as a pass-through grant from the Utah Division of State History from the National Park Service's underrepresented community initiative. The purpose of the project was to conduct an intensive pedestrian survey of four blocks on Bureau of Land Management lands in Box Elder <clears throat> and Emory counties in Utah. The blocks were centered on two Central Pacific Railroad communities, Bovine and Ombi in Box Elder County and within two blocks along the Denver and Rio Grande Railroad in Emory County that historically also employed Chinese workers. As part of this project, a survey of the railroad town of Terrace was also conducted. In this presentation, I will limit my discussion um, only to the results of the Central Pacific Railroad grade in Emory and uh, Box Elder County. So a little bit of, of background for those of you that might not have uh, a deep understanding of, of, of the um, impetus for the Chinese railroad workers in North America. But during the early and middle part of the 19th century, pressure from Western powers to gain trade access to China and uh, a series of natural disasters, economic problems, and a series of military defeats at the hands of the British led to increasing unrest within China. These issues culminated in the Taiping Rebellion or the Chinese Civil War, which left between 20 to 70 million dead and many more millions displaced. It was under this turmoil that Chinese men, particularly from the Guangdong province, uh, sought economic opportunities abroad. And they did not only came to the United States, they went to Cuba, they went to um, Australia, they, they, they sought uh, economic um, opportunities across a lot of different parts of the, of the world. Um, but the, probably one of their most important impacts was, was in uh, Western North America. Uh, the first of Chinese immigrants came to California in the 1840s seeking riches in the California gold fields. With the passage of the Pacific Railroad Act of 1862, the impetus to begin organization and construction of the Transcontinental Railroad was underway. However, progress for the Central Pacific Railroad in the Sierra Mountains was difficult, uh, and anybody that's been watching Hell on Wheels can, can see that. Uh, Ch Charles Crocker, chief engineer, was unable to keep crews. He estimated he needed uh, 5,000 men but could barely hire 600. Crews were abandoning the railroad at a rate of three out of five employees. Uh, working only long enough to ride the train to the, tr to the railhead where they abandoned it for the Nevada gold and silver fields where they assumed that work would be a lot easier and, and more profitable. Um, desperate to keep on schedule, Crocker made the suggestion to his construction supervisor, James Strobridge, that Chinese men might be able to, to fill the needed gap in laborers. Strobridge felt the Chinese were too slight and weak to accomplish the task, but Crocker persisted enthusiastically reminded him that these same people had built the Great Wall of China. These Chinese immigrants began work in 1865, showing up at railroad work sites in organized gangs with a single headman. Their labor was so impressed Crocker, he began recruiting uh, for more men in China. And what was interesting about the Chinese, uh, as opposed to mostly Irish um, workers at the time, is the Chinese had to get there by themselves. The white workers, Euro American workers, were able to ride the rail to the work sites. So they were already starting out, um, you know, in, 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 in somewhat desperate situations that, um, that, the, that the white workers would, didn't have to um, overcome. In 1868, the number of Chinese workers rose to 12,000 and comprised at least 80% of the Ch uh, Central Pacific's workforce. During the final push of 1868 to 1869, it is estimated that as many as 6,000 workers toiled across northern Utah. Working conditions were obviously difficult with few machines available. As Mike Polk describes, the common tools consisted of picks, shovels, pry bars, horse and mule drawn carts, and wheelbarrows supplemented by nitroglycerin and blasting powder. Some estimates indicate that one in 10 Chinese workers died during railroad construction, about 1.7 deaths per constructed mile. Workers likely lived in canvas tent camps alongside the grade, possibly pitched over dugout features that would have provided additional protection from winds and cold weather. Fireplaces may also have been constructed within the dwellings. Each gang had a cook who, per who purchased dried food to be cooked on site, periodically traveling to San Francisco or Sacramento um, 
to purchase food from Chinese vendors. Foods would have included vegetables and seafood, and at some camps, live pigs and, and chickens were kept. This is in sharp contrast to the Irish crews who habitually ate boiled beef and potatoes. Hygiene seems to have been important to the Chinese who bathed and washed their clothes regularly. Instead of drinking the provided water, they drank lukewarm tea provided throughout the day, having been boiled that morning. This may have allowed them to avoid the dysentery that com commonly ravaged white crews. While these descriptions are, are overly generalized and romanticized, they do provide important clues upon which to assess and interpret the archaeological record. So here we have um, what we can actually use as actual testable hypotheses um, for the archaeological record. Um, the portion of interest to us lies west of Promontory Summit in Box Elder County, a distance of about 90 miles, and is known as the Promontory Branch. Um, this was the original grade from the Nevada border, uh, and it was eventually replaced in 1904 with the Lucin cutoff that is basically the minor grade that parallels I-80 today. Um, today the grade is preserved and protected by the Bureau of Land Management as an area of critical environmental concern, but is also accessible as a, a, natural, a national backcountry byway. The promontory branch is in the high desert region of rural northern Utah. Even today, the area is far removed from the urban populations of the Wasatch Front. No significant water sources are present, and water had to be hauled to work sites by train and wooden barrels. Even after completion of the railroad, access to potable water was still an issue. At Terrace, a 12-mile aqueduct was constructed in the 1880s to bring culinary water from Grouse Creek and numerous, and numerous efforts to drill wells in 1892 was eventually abandoned. Fuel to power locomotives was typically from coal, but sagebrush was also used, as was wood hauled by horse-drawn wagons from the Raft River Mountains, a uh, straight line distance of about 17 miles. Temperatures could range from 106 degrees in the summer to minus 28 degrees in winter, and the winter of 1868-69 is noted as particularly brutal. So workers were working year-round, six days a week. They only had Sundays off under, uh, under some pretty remarkable conditions. In 1980, Anand Raman and Richard Fike provided the first comprehensive archaeological survey of the original grade of the Promontory Branch. They recorded the various branch stations along the 90-mile route, providing the first assessment of site conditions, noting the effects of decades of erosion and unauthorized collection. In addition to producing the BLM published monograph on the results, Jerry Wiley and Richard Fike developed an important taxonomy of Chinese opium smoking techniques and paraphernalia, still an important uh, resource for us today. Uh, more specific efforts have been focused within the boundaries of Golden Spike National Historic Site. These include Adrian Anderson's assessment of dis uh, domestic structures on Promontory Summit and the more recent overview and assessment conducted by sagebrush consultants in the late 1990s and 2000s under the direction of Mike Polk. Polk's work on the archaeology of the Central Pacific Railroad and Chinese work camps continues as an important resource and a guide for other researchers. Um, Chris Merritt's dissertation research on a Chinese experience in Montana did not end there, and he continues to research the archaeology of Chinese workers in Utah. Um, but what, what's um, important to note is that even though there has been 30, 40 years worth of research out there, it's always been kind of sporadic. and and the grant from the National Park Service in uh, state history was to kind of provide us with an impetus to begin a more concerted, focused research effort um, on that work up there. So our field methods were relatively straightforward. Um, we had pedestrian survey of the project area was the first step with crew members spaced it, um, at very close intervals. Any artifacts or features that we were encounter we marked with pin flags and uh, following the completion of the survey, we had smaller teams went back um, and began documenting, uh, photographing, and mapping each artifact and feature. Um, this usually resulted in a documentation of a larger number of artifacts than were originally identified. Uh, all documented items were mapped with a, a Topcon RTK, which um, provided high resolution mapping very quickly for us. Uh, with the exception of the coin and gaming pieces from Terrace, no art items were collected during the survey. Uh, bovine served as 
as a section station from 1869 to about 1905. In 1869, the facilities included a section house, train car body, Chinese bunk and cook house. Bridges and culverts were also, uh, were also constructed. Uh, the section station also had a siding that was used for loading and unloading freight. A census taken in 1870 recorded two white foremen and 17 Chinese section hands were in residence, and the average age of the Chinese workers there was 29.23 years. And so this is uh, an archaeological map of uh, results of our survey. And you can see um, distribution of, of artifacts, um, different types of Chinese, ethnic Chinese, and Euro-American artifacts, mostly tin cans. Um, and particularly what's of interest to us is this area here which has, has a number of depressions, some of the earliest um, types of ethnic Chinese artifacts um, that probably represents the, the original work camp. Um, these depressions might represent, uh, we think represent the, the Chinese workers um, that probably had canvas tents constructed over these, these depressions. And then um, later on, probably in um, the 1860s and 70s, late uh, 1869, 70, uh, Central Pacific Railroad started to um, construct more formalized uh, buildings for, for the workers. Okay, so I don't have much time. I'm just going to run through some of the artifacts we found out there. And a number of features that are identified out there. And those depressions probably represent some of the Chinese um, living uh, areas. And again, this is a, shows a map that we have from 1870 um, that, that shows some of the structures from the Central Pacific Railroad that we can relate the archaeological record to. And Ambi is another um, section station that we uh, did intensive survey on, a uh, similar type of, of uh, distribution of artifacts. Archaeologists love stuff. <laughs> and again, uh, a map that we've that we've used um, from Central Pacific Railroad to try and interpret um, the archaeological remains out there. Um, Terrace is a served as a Central Pacific Railroad <coughs> maintenance and repair headquarters for the Salt Lake Division uh, from about 1869 to 1910. Uh, extensive facilities existed at, uh, to service the railroad, but also to support a community that, at its height, may have. Uh, have been as many as 1,000 residents, although we've had trouble um, actually reproducing that number. Um, but what, what's interesting about it is that the, the community was much larger, much, divor much more diverse, much more cosmopolitan than any community that exists up there today. I think Snowville, the closest town um, to the railroad grade today, has about 150 um, people living in it. Um, the 1870 census documented 22 Chinese males aged um, 12 to 55 and one 28-year-old Chinese woman who probably served as a prostitute. Um, the 12-year-old boy identified as Asa Ha uh, is one of the youngest employees of the Central Pacific Railroad that we've been able to document in census records. So this is a, an aerial photo. Um, of the remains of Terrace and um, some of the mapped archaeological features that the BLM did in the in the 18 or the 1980s, um, various artifacts that have been identified there. Uh, you can see um, the Chinese community is is segregated in the southeast part of the, the site. This is just a close up of of uh, the artifact distributions on a on a plat map from the, from the town. Uh, these are a couple of the artifacts that we, we did collect um, and we did those because there was a, when we showed up on the site there was somebody out there with a metal detector and um, so we wanted to take these things since they were probably valuable items that he was looking for. Um, so the uh, one thing that we've been beginning to explore is uh, the census data and you can see um, census data from Terrace from 1870 and 1880 pretty well shows us the aging of the of the Chinese workers out there and part of that is because during the 1870s and 1880s there was an incredible amount of uh, pushback and in anti-Chinese sediments and eventually legislation 
that excluded the Chinese from, from uh, emigrating into America. And this act was not um, repealed until 1942 when we needed the Chinese as an ally against the Japanese. Uh, although the Central Pacific Railroad is protected, grade is protected as an ECAC by the BLM, each site is being rapidly degraded by trampling, erosion, and unauthorized collection and vandalism. Um, our work, although preliminary, provides evidence of the potential knowledge available through intensive inventory, artifact descriptions, and mapping without the need for collection or excavation. Obviously, more sophisticated questions can be addressed through excavation and artifact collection, but this time it's not feasible for us. The work we have begun this, this uh, over the course of the last year and a half is part of an ongoing effort by anthropologists and archaeologists to understand and highlight the significance of the efforts of the various ethnic and cultural groups that have made lasting contributions to the United States. Our work, obviously, has been focused on the Chinese railroad workers. The relevance in today's political climate should not be under, understated. Uh, formal recognition of tremendous effort and contribution that Chinese laborers made to the construction of the Transcontinental Railroad and the influences had in making the United States an economic power is, uh, is finally being achieved. While the significance of the railroad to the economic development of the United States cannot be overlooked, not all the consequences were positive. Uh, displacement of native groups and radical changes to North American environments come quickly to mind. Where historians were largely responsible for the telling of this story, archaeologists and anthropologists have more recently begun to make a serious contribution. This is most apparent by the Chinese Railroad Workers in North America project at Stanford University. We hope the work we are doing in Emory County and, uh, and also in Box Elder County will continue, um, contribute to this telling. And um, so just to acknowledge a few individuals, Dr. Chris Merritt for um, securing the National Park Service grant and Dr. Michael Sheehan, uh, Salt Lake Field Office, which provided um, a lot of uh, um, logistical support for us while we were doing the work out there and also our um, team of archaeologists. So thank you.